My mom's probably watching this. Y'all gonna get me in trouble. <laughs> And I just call that mama bear. Um, but it, it came to a point where like, I was like, let people help. Having that very uncomfortable conversation and then setting like boundaries and expectations, I think are huge. But I knew at this moment, this was the oncologist who was holding me back from getting a second opinion on fertility treatments find that when you're a young adult with cancer, you really can feel like you're on an island by yourself. Uh, my name is Stephanie Trong. I'm really glad that you could join us today wherever you're joining us from. I am the founder of The Patient's Story and I'm also a cancer survivor. I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin lymphoma a few years ago and am grateful to be in remission, but this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. Self-advocacy, this entire conversation will be about uh, speaking up for ourselves. And so really quickly, uh, the patient's story is um, you know, created out of my own experience. I wanted to, you can see a picture of me, there with uh, very, I was getting my head shaved. Um, you know, I, I wanted to hear from other people. And that's what was going on when I started the patient's story. And that's where you'll find hundreds of um, patient voices and, and videos, and hopefully, you know, that will help with connection. We're also bringing this event uh, to you with our partners, uh, Immerman Angels, an incredible organization. I have to say, I uh, used Immerman Angels actually when I was going through my treatment. And what it is, is they help connect you one-on-one -on -one with cancer support. That means, you know, whether you're a patient, you're a caregiver, a care partner, a survivor, a pre-viver, they will, you know, make sure that you meet someone who's close to what you're about to go to, uh, go through, I should say. On that note, we, uh, the patient story and Emmerman Angels, we have full control of the entire content, all the editorial. It's not intended to be medical advice. So please, please consult your healthcare provider and team if you're having to make um, medical decisions. So we're going to start uh, today with Delicia. Hi, how's it going? I'm good. My name is Delicia. I'm from Louisiana. Um, I was first diagnosed in 2020 of June, um, right before I turned 30. Um, I'm currently just graduated as a medical biller and coder and I'm about to get back in the workforce. Yay, exciting. Exciting, exciting. Um, thank you for sharing that. I know it was really difficult because it was during the pandemic um, for you, Delicia. So thank you for, for sharing that. Next up, we have Erica. And Erica is actually joining from my neck of the woods. And so Erica, can you introduce yourself? Hi, thanks, Stephanie. My name's Erica. I am from San Francisco, California. I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma stage 3B, September of 2019, and in remission as of 2020 of March. So right as the pandemic was hitting off, um, I belong to a runner's club and the motto is start slowly and then taper off. So in all things, starting my business, but especially doing treatment, that motto was really important. I love that. Sometimes I think we expect too much of ourselves to like go fast and that can be really difficult. So thank you, Erica. Next up, we're going to go to Tyler. Can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Tyler. Uh, I'm currently in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma in 2014. Uh, as of August 1st of this year, so a couple of weeks ago, I just hit my five year um, anniversary of no chemo. So that's pretty big. Uh, for myself, I am a, a videographer and photographer, and then I also own an insurance agency. So I uh, got a lot going on these days. And just to clarify too, because you had a relapse. So the five years is since that, that relapsed treatment that you had. So that's awesome. So glad we could kind of celebrate this um, as a moment. And we will be talking about survivorship at the end of this. So thank you, Tyler. And uh, last but not least is Kelsey, uh, who is joining us from Arkansas, I believe. Kelsey, can you describe yourself? 
Yeah, hi, I'm Kelsey. Um, like she said, I'm joining you from Bentonville, Arkansas, which is my hometown, but I actually live in Austin, Texas. And I was diagnosed with stage 2A Hodgkin's lymphoma in September 2017, and I've been in remission since March 2018. Um, I am an architectural historian and a writer. I dabble in comedy writing and screenwriting, and I also own a vintage furniture company. Thank you so much for sharing that, Kelsey. I love that each of our panelists um, really represents a different sort of situation. So we're gonna be able to hear a range of experiences. So with that, let's hop right into our conversation. The first part of it is really, we title it Doctor Knows Best. Um, I don't know if you felt that. I've definitely felt this kind of the, I don't wanna be that patient. I don't wanna annoy my doctor. I don't wanna speak up too much. They're trained, I'm not. Um, but there's a lot to talk about here when we say self-advocacy, because it is our lives after all. Delicia, you said that you felt like you were trying to tell people, hey, I have all these things that I'm feeling. I know it's not right. Uh, can you describe what that felt like for you? It felt like I, um, I had to really, you know, talk my way through it, <laughs> talk my way out, um, like, you know, constantly let them know that, um, okay, this is not normal. Um, yeah, it took a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it can be hard, I think, to, to fight through that. I'm going to bring, you can stay on if you'd like, but I'd like for Erica to come on too now, because Erica has a very specific situation too, in terms of a cultural um, difference here where you felt really unheard. Can you talk about what happened there? When I finally met with the oncologist, which was my first oncology appointment, it was really trying because at that point I, I had a feeling I had Hodgkin's lymphoma. I think all the signs were there. My primary had said like, what was the saying? Like if it cracks like a duck, <laughs> like walks like a duck, it must be a duck. And I was going into the oncology appointment knowing I was going to get that diagnosis. So I wanted to present my needs and that was a lot of cultural, you know, like too, I wanted to have conversations from a nutritionist about, you know, how I can integrate that care and it wasn't listened to. <laughs> In fact, there were some statements made that made me really uncomfortable. So much that when I stepped out of the appointment, I turned to my husband and I said, I cannot go through this process if I'm not gonna be able to have a conversation. Like I get that I have to have treatment, but I need to know that they're going to listen to what I need to get through this. So it was on that, that I started exploring different doctors, but it wasn't until a friend said, why don't you just look beyond it, within the network that you're in? Maybe there's another oncologist and it's already an easy, but my primary concern was that I wanted to be heard. So I was fortunate enough to like find a doctor who was willing to do that. And basically they said the same thing <laughs> as the first doctor, but their statements were presented different. He explored some of the, the things that I wanted to look into and research. I actually really want to kind of highlight that for a moment though, because it seems small. At the end of the day, both doctors agreed essentially on, on the same thing. They had the same opinion about treatments, but one doctor dismissed you right off the bat because they were like, this is, I don't know about, you know, this other kind of, you know, cultural thought process with treatment. The other one, what did it mean? I guess, what is that difference? It seems minor, but it's pretty big. It was big because uh, it just showed patience and just me being able to advocate, which is the theme <laughs> and the topic of our conversation today. That was really important for me. I, I'm, I'm an admissions consultant, so I teach students how to self-advocate. And now I was actually putting into practice for my own self in a health crisis and being able to advocate and not I know that they are the experts in the medical field, but that I'm an expert on how I feel. And so not having my feelings dismissed was just so important because I had done readings on all these ideas like mind body, <laughs> you know, as part of that. And I wanted to feel positive. And that doctor made me feel positive about this, that it wasn't going to be as scary as it already was for me. And that they understood I had a whole team around me who <laughs> would voice their concerns and, you know, opinions on, on what I should do. And at least I could have conversations with him about that. And so knowing how to respond to those people, he became a partner 
in this process of treatment and healing. And I wanna highlight that word partner. That can be, that's what we're aiming for, I think, right? Everyone just feels like they're part of this. So actually it's a great segue into our next section. I'd love to bring up both Kelsey and, and Tyler for this. Um, we are talking about uh, shared treatment decision-making. And uh, what does that mean? It means that it's not just one directional. It's not the medical team only and the doctor only. It's, hey, I, I, I'm part of this. This is my life. Um, I know that you have the training, but I want to be empowered in my care. So for Kelsey, who we're going to start off with, it's about, I did my own research. It changed everything. And then Tyler will talk about, there was a common you know, medication given, but he, he was like, I know my body best. Let's not do this. So Kelsey, um, this is actually a great, a really great example um, of, of advocacy, I feel. If you could give a little backdrop of, you know, what your treatment was, the impact, like the side effects you were feeling, and what got you to research and the impact of the research. Yeah, um, so I had stage 2A Hodgkin's, and so I was uh, prescribed ABVD chemo, I believe it was four cycles, um, so eight treatments total, and after my, I think my fourth treatment, um, I ended up in the hospital with neutropenic fever. I experienced really low white blood cell counts, um, during my entire course of treatment, starting right after my first chemo. And I, you know, I had to, it was the middle of winter, a lot of colds going around I picked up something small, ended up with pneumonia over Christmas here in Arkansas. And so I was in the hospital for, um, four or five days, um, dealing with that. And that was probably the lowest point in my treatment. Um, so I asked the doctors and nurses when I got back to Austin, if I could add new Lasta to my regimen, which would boost my white blood cell count, make me, um, you know, less susceptible to infection. So they told me that I could not do that because it would interact with the bleomycin in the ABVD. And I was already experiencing some side effects from the bleomycin. It can cause lung scarring. I wasn't having that issue, but I was just having scarring all over my body. Um, I could tell it was not great. I was wondering if it's doing this to my arms, what's it doing to my lungs. So I did some research and I found um, some recent studies that had shown that people, and I believe it was people who had 12 total ABVD treatments, so six rounds, um, if they were clear after their, I believe, second cycle, then the bleomycin could be safely removed from the chemo. Um, so I brought that to my doctor and said, hey, I know this isn't my exact situation and I have fewer treatments, et cetera, but do you think that this would work for me so that I could add, um, new Lasta. So I am, you know, don't end up in the hospital again. Cause I feel at this point, um, because I'd already had a clear scan, that that's a greater risk to my health. And my doctor agreed with me and actually commented that he'd just been discussing that research at a, um, conference he'd just been to. And so I removed that from my regimen and I've been in the clear for five years almost. So, um, seems to be <laughs> fine so far. I remember his wording exactly was, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So that's, that worked out for me. And I was able to take the new last to get my white blood cell count up and did not end up in the hospital again. First of all, just to really show the impact. Um, now we've been through COVID, we understand more of like, you know, being immunocompromised and, and feeling like I have to just not go anywhere. Everything's going to infect me. It could lead to, you know, hospitalization, which it did for you. Um, First, I would like you to describe the impact to your, you know, like, you know, your, your psyche or just like your emotions to feel like I can't do anything right now because of this treatment. Yeah. Um, you know, and I don't think I quite understood the beginning of treatment. And when my white blood cell count got really low, the impact of that and what that meant for me. Um, and you know, I, I felt anyway, like I was always having to be in a bubble. And like you said, I think a lot of people got a taste of that, especially at the beginning of the pandemic when we were all terrified. Um, but you know, once I ended up in the hospital, it was a really nasty flu season. I, the doctors basically were treating me like I was, you know, like they were being so careful with me and that really freaked me out. And that time in the hospital was really, really rough. Um, so after that, I, before I was able to get the new Lasta, I, I just lived in like such isolation, which I was doing already. You feel 
uh, extremely vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I, I was so terrified that someone I would come in contact with had a roommate with the flu or something. Cause that could have, you know, been really, really bad for me at that point. He had no defense systems. And so right. you had, you know, um, research experience being in grad school. And so there was this access issue, um, where it was, Hey, I have the know-how to research this stuff, but what about other people, right? Who don't have access. And so part of that is because you were able to empower yourself with that uh, knowledge, you brought it to the doctor. And that started this very important cascade of events where it led to, okay, cool. I can, um, I can breathe easier now. Like literally I don't have to have that be in my regimen. You know, like what was it that got you to finally to speak up? Did it take much? Um, you know, I think it was just that stay in the hospital. I, I didn't want to go into too much detail, but there was like a man who was dying in the room next to me and, you know, crying out a lot. And it was a really, really scary experience because it was a really, there was a lot of infection and stuff around me. And the doctors were scared that I was even in the hospital because it could kill me. Um, and they, so that fear is when it really hit me, how very, very serious this is. And I'm, I'm a chronic research. I mean, I just will research things to the point where it's not healthy sometimes. And so this was something I was, I just really was looking into because I was looking for any option, um, to be able to get the new last, uh, mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. And I, this is why I think sites like the patient story are so important because if I had had someone who had been through that before to tell me this, that would be a lot easier and a lot less scary. Well, thank you for sharing that Kelsey. I really appreciate you um, so much. Tyler, I know for you, it was a little bit different. Uh, and during one of your treatments, they had that Benadryl. It's a very common um, medication, you know, that's given to help avoid like allergic reactions. But for you, that was kind of the problem. Can you share that with us? Yeah. So uh, my whole experience, like going through the chemo, I never really had any like bad side effects. Like I was told people like, like I still had an appetite. Like the worst thing that happened to me going through chemo was like losing my hair. Um, and then I just remember getting like Benadryl one day, uh, before, uh, they were giving me chemo and I was just like knocked out afterwards. Um, so I would drive myself to my, uh, chemo appointments. And so they're like the hospital I was going to is about an hour away. And, uh, this was like my second time. Uh, this is like when the, uh, cancer had relapsed. And so I, uh, I would go there. It took about like maybe an hour, hour and a half for the, for this uh, treatment that I was on, the chemo that I was on. And uh, then I'd have to stay for an extra like hour and a half just for the nurses to feel comfortable for letting me go home because of the Benadryl. They didn't want me like falling asleep while I was driving, which is great. But like, I also just didn't want to be like in the chemo chair any longer than what I needed to. So I remember asking the nurses or asking the doctor like one day, like, can I just like not receive the Benadryl? Can I not receive like some of the stuff I, you know, that you're recommending beforehand? Can we just see like what that, what that does? Can, you know, is that possible a possibility? And sure enough, they said, um, they, you know, checked in with the doctor. They said, yeah, the doctor said that's fine. Like we can, we can forego that. And after that, like getting the chemo treatments to me was a much more enjoyable experience. If I could say that it's enjoyable, that's kind of weird to say, but um, yeah, so, so that made it a much easier experience for me. And I wasn't like, like the side effects from the Benadryl were bigger or I noticed them more than the side effects from the chemo. Even though I'm sure my body was going through a lot through the chemo, I just noticed it way, way more with that Benadryl. Well, I, I love this as an example because in general, you know, it's like, oh, well, you're giving me this because we know that it's supposed to help, but you knew your body, you knew that you weren't having the reaction. Also, something else that I really loved um, when we talked about this is you said you would need, you were so drowsy having to depend on somebody else to, like, you're a very independent person. Can you describe mm -hmm. that impact for you? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, being independent, like I like to do the things on my own. Like I didn't want to have like a friend or family have to spend like time to have to come, you know, be with me during chemo and maybe an inconvenience for them. Um, and then it also like for me, like mentally, it was just nice to be able to like do things on my own. So if I'm able to go to like uh, to go get chemo by myself, that's fine. I mean, at this point, I just, I, you know, I seem like a regular um, I was there, you know, every couple of weeks for a 
felt like forever. I think like over like a year plus. So it wasn't anything that I wasn't used to. Definitely the first few times getting treatment, I had friends and family there then after that I was like well I don't want you all waiting around for like four or five hours like this is kind of ridiculous right so, right yeah and so being able to speak up for yourself in that instance because you know your body allowed you to have kind of regain control of that again because otherwise you'd be at the mercy of well I need you to drive me I need you to drive me um and by the way we'll talk to you Tyler in this next section about boundaries and protecting energy so thank you for sharing that um, which is a perfect segue now to go into the next section um, on protecting boundaries and energy. And what does that mean? It's it's more of the, I don't want to, um, you know, like offend other people, I would say. That's what we're going to talk about. And we'll start with uh, Delicia, who will talk about her mama bear. You said mama bear <laughs> had a lot to say uh, about going to appointments, who was going with you, Tyler, to share about mom being a nurse. Um, and what that kind of, you know, it sounds great and it was helpful, but also you had to tell her to stop helping. And then Erica having a very opposite situation. So let's dive in with Delicia. Um, Delicia, you, I know, lived with your sister for part of the treatment um, and you talked about mama bear. <laughs> yeah, my mom's probably watching this. Y'all going to get me in trouble. <laughs> this is a, a loving act when we talk about what is happening with this. It's a loving act. So, but could you just describe that? What what that meant? You know, you, you're as a parent. I can imagine like your child going through something or seeing your child go through that. But at the beginning, um, she was very hands on. She was the one that had to take me to the appointment. She re really wanted anybody else like stepping in, and I just call that mama bear. Um, but it it came to a point where like I was like let people help you know um you know to make things go smoothly but when I moved over um when I changed doctors um my sister had to be my caregiver and she didn't really have um as much access to coming um to the appointments so um instead we would record the um the appointments for my parents so they can listen in so they can actually be there and if they had questions um they gave us the questions and we would answer we'll we would ask the questions for the um for them but other than that it was <laughs> it was a roller coaster <laughs> Well, I, I appreciate, first of all, if Delicia's mom is out there, hi and awesome. And I love moms. I'm a mom. I love my mom. <laughs> moms are great. Um, but there is something, Delicia, I'd like for you to sort of just respond to, which is there's a balance, right? It's like, it's wonderful getting that support. But at the same time, sometimes does it feel like I have to manage other people's feelings too? Yes. <laughs> big time um when going through it um your emotions is all over the place like I don't know if it was the chemo the anxiety all of it together and the my caregivers and my support system was going through it with me so there I was very cautious of their emotions too and I don't think anybody um knew how to handle handle it so a lot of the times I would have to bring my earphones and like just pop my earphones in my ear, ear and listen to music. And I'm like, or I just be like honest and be like, okay, I don't feel like talking. I don't feel like being bothered. And, you know, they, they know me, my personality. So I don't think they were too offended, but I had to set those boundaries and be like, okay, I'm still processing processing what I'm going through and I don't want to like I don't have the mental space to nurture your feelings about it too <laughs> I am really thankful that you're bringing this up I know it can be hard to talk about but it is so true and I've talked with many other people who feel the same way it's almost like even as soon as we get diagnosed it's still a little bit of oh gosh but I don't want to I don't want to you know hurt this person's feelings or or, or whatever and it's like considering so many um, it, there's just a lot going on. And so I appreciate that you set an example of, hey, take care of yourself first, give yourself some grace. It's okay to say no. 
So on that note, I'd like to bring on Tyler, who also uh, had a, an experience um, having to learn how to protect boundaries and say no. Tyler, if you could describe, I know you already talked a little bit about how you're an independent person. Um, just describe a little bit more about your mom, what she does, and how those first appointments were for you. Dealing with my mom being the nurse practitioner, uh, it's kind of like a blessing in disguise because a lot of the more medical questions or things that could or could not happen, um, I was able to just kind of leave that up to her. Or if I had questions that the doctors were asking or um, they're bringing up, like I could just ask her in more detail afterwards. Uh, but then at the same time, um, it came to a point when she was coming to appointments with me, um, when I moved back home after the cancer had relapsed, um, um, or yeah, so speaking of being independent, I think being told I had cancer wasn't the worst part of this process. It was being told that I was going to have to move back home with my parents. Uh, so when I actually moved back home, that was very hard for me. Uh, I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be a burden and I just didn't want to be, um, back home. It wasn't a, a place that I wanted to be at, um, and having to be like, you know, 24, 25 living with my parents. Um, but that's what ended up happening. And then my mom was coming to appointments and I told her, uh, afterwards, like, I can't have her come to these appointments anymore. She was, the, it was, it got to the point where, Essentially, if the doctor asked me a question or asked me what is my name, and by the time he said name, if I wasn't saying Tyler, she was the one responding to these answers. And so that's where I was kind of like, I was like, I told her, uh, we had like a long conversation one day of saying like, I just need you to like, not come to these appointments. It's not good for me mentally. It's not good for me um, emotionally. Like, I just need to be in a good space. Um, basically, I've I moved back home to make this easier on you all. So, uh, cause originally I was going to go to Houston to be treated, but it came back to Michigan to make it easier. So the family didn't have to travel in case they needed to be somewhere for me. Um, and so I was already going through, you know, withdrawing a lot from my emotional piggy bank as I like to call it to be back home. And, um, I said, you know, had the conversation with her. I was like, if there's questions that you feel like I need to be asking the doctor, like I will, you know, talk, I will tell you after I get back from the doctor, you know, um, give her a summary of like what happened, what questions I asked, if there's anything that she wanted to ask going into it, I could ask them. And if she didn't feel like those questions I was asking were adequate, then, um, you know, we could have another discussion about that. And so I know that was very hard. Um, cause I told her in that conversation, you know, I don't have any children, so I don't know what it's like to be a parent with a child who's going through this, um, and I know I'm assuming as a parent, you want to be there for your kids and do everything that you possibly can. But I was also like, at this time, I was like, I'm a grown adult and I would like to be able to answer these questions from the doctors. And I would also just like need this for my space. Um, and yeah, but I also knew if that was her process for going through this, then I was giving her that space, but that space was impeding my space and I could no longer allow that time to, to take over my space. What I'm hearing, and I heard this also with Delicia, is that it's hard. There's a juggle, going, a juggling of things going on here where you're trying to be mindful. You said something about, I don't want to rob them of their experience of being parents to me in this way. At the same time, it's already hard being home. I want to be independent. I still need to feel like me, like Tyler. Are there any tips in terms of like how you were able to make that make that move from, oh my gosh, I don't really want to talk to my mom about this. I know she really cares. I know this to, I, I'm just going to do it. I wish I would have had this conversation sooner of just being upfront about it. But for me, it was like, we're coming back from an appointment. She's like, why are you so quiet? Like you never talk on these rides. I was like, well, number one, like I just got chemo. Like, I guess I'm tired. And I just had that Benadryl. So like I'm out of it. And I was like, I just don't, want to talk about it. Like, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to discuss it. Like, I just, you know, don't want to be a part of it. And so that conversation, like we pulled in the driveway and then it turned into like an hour and a half about like everything. But these were all thoughts that I've had before. And I was just like, I don't know how to express these. Um, so I think just, I don't know, writing down your thoughts, I think is, is good. Kind of taking inventory of yourself, like who you are, what you need. And then having that very uncomfortable conversation um, and then setting like boundaries and expectations, I think are huge. Uh, Cause I remember my mom was like, 
you know, I'll make you dinner. I'll go grocery shopping for you. I'll do your laundry. And I was like, I don't want any of those things. I told her, it's like, if I am physically unable to do any of those things, I am doing those. Now, I'm not saying I don't need your help, but when I need it, I'll ask. Appreciate you sharing that because again, it can be very difficult. Um, but to your point, sometimes we don't even know that we're bothered or know that something's up. And so your tip of, hey, maybe write things down. Like if you notice something, just write it down, see if it's a pattern that will be helpful um, in having this conversation. So thank you, Tyler. Um, Erica actually had the complete opposite <laughs> experience. Fortunate where my parents lived nearby, only 20 minutes away. And I do want to be fair to my mom. She did come to my first appointment <laughs> and then sort of, it was too crowded in the room where I was getting treatment. So it was sort of like a nice way for her not to uh, have to attend since my husband was going to be able to go with me. And I can't reiterate enough Tyler's point about writing things down because I wanted to be independent as much as possible. And I was able to control that through just reflecting on what I would need. And as having a doctor as a partner was really helpful in sort of figuring out where those needs would come up. Um, but it's a lot on one caretaker. So I was diagnosed in September of 2019 and it was going to fall into the holidays, my treatment. And my husband was awesome, like getting to the appointments, he played a good music playlist and always kept an upbeat, you know, a positive environment while I was getting treatment. And for the most part, I was able to handle a lot on my own when he was at work, but he was also working full time and it was the holidays and because you're immunocompromised, you have to maybe sacrifice a big family gathering. And I could see it start to wear on my husband a little bit. And he was starting to burn out. And I actually told him like, if you are not available to me, I need you to just give yourself a break because it's not gonna be helpful to me. And my parents at this point didn't, they knew that he was going through a lot, my husband, but maybe not specifically on how they could support the community that I needed to rally around me because their parents, they are emotionally involved and it meant, involving them without <laughs> with being very specific on how I needed them. So when writing things down, there were things on my task, like, task list that I just couldn't manage, even though I wanted to be independent. Those were disability paperwork. You know, I was still trying to figure out how to get, you know, disability uh, checks. And I also didn't feel or didn't know what to cook for myself to deal with the side effects. So I remember just one afternoon telling my parents, okay, I know that you have a lot going on, which they did. There was a lot of other things happening in their personal lives, but I said, I really need your, you to one, help me with this paperwork <laughs> and two, help me like come up with some good recipes for the side effects. And here's a list. And they jumped to it. They were so happy and they didn't even realize that I needed them in that way. They were waiting for me to tell them because they thought my husband had it all. But once my husband was burned out, I was like, I need you now to step in. It, 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 I was a facilitator of this really difficult process, but it was easier when I was able to direct them on how to help me. And this is such a great juxtaposition against what we just heard from Delicia and Tyler when we have this range of experiences. The people around us may or may not know what we need. Um, they may do too much, they may do too little. And so in your case, you advocated for yourself because A, you knew one with your husband, um, I need a care partner who, thank you for all you've done, but if you're not gonna have the energy at this next appointment, I need to know so that I can have someone there who can be at 100% for me. And that the other thing you did was recognize, well, my parents, my brother, they don't really seem to be stepping in. I'm just gonna tell them what I need. Um, can you share, I think sometimes it's hard. We're going to talk about this next, which is asking for help. So I don't want to get too far into it, but I mean, it can be hard to be that direct, you know, in, in having those conversations. Did you find anything helped you to have these conversations or? Well, I was, I was really writing intensely and I was uh, participating. There's an organization in Berkeley called the Women's Cancer Resource Center, and they had a writing group. And so there were things some directedness that I was giving um, to my dad specifically. And there's, 
you know, there's a cultural component too, right? Like he was having a really hard time adjusting to the fact that I was, you know, going through this experience and I really wanted him to hear my needs and concerns and it was just difficult. So in that difficult conversation of being heard of what I needed and what I wanted, um, I just sort of met what I needed. <laughs> so if he couldn't respond completely to it, I recognized that and just said, okay, like, I'm going to be direct. Like, I just like make me juice <laughs> and I know you love me and that's enough and everything else we'll deal with later on. Whereas my mom, it's just different, our relationship. And that was really helpful to her to kind of not get emotional <laughs> as the emotionally charged. So it was like, Hey, you know what? There's some paperwork. I really know you're good at like dealing with this. So can we sit down for an hour? And it was just logical for her to like sit down and go through it. And then I didn't have to invite her into the emotional piece unless I saw that she was ready for that. And the same was for my brother. Um, when my husband, because my husband lives with me, right? <laughs> he got all of it, which is why he was dealing with the burnout. I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't find any other way than to be direct with him. I mean, I, I, I actually told him after Christmas, we celebrate Christmas. I said, like, I get it was hard for you. And I know, you know, it's hard for me, but I need you to go with your brother to Reno <laughs> and like watch football, like get away. And, and everyone thought it was weird that he would go and he was starting to feel guilty. And I, it was the best thing for us because then he came back with energy and I had had brought in my parents and my brother to sort of step in for that. Thank you for sharing that because one huge piece of this, of course, is we're not going through this alone. We are diagnosed with it, but along with us is everyone around us, maybe a spouse or a partner or family members, friends, and caregivers and care partners need to have care too. Okay. Um, and so that's a really, really good message. And so thank you for sharing that. And this is another great segue into talking about asking for help. So we're going to pop up um, what that is. And that's, it can be really hard, but it's about burdening. So this we're going to go through pretty quickly. I think um, if you have questions, feel free to submit them. But Kelsey, um, we're going to start with you. If you could talk about, um, you know, you had support, uh, but you also mentioned something about if you're not in the right place, to maybe just don't be afraid to ask, right? I think that sometimes with such a large support team, it was a lot of breadth, not a lot of depth, and there was not a lot of organization. So it was kind of difficult for me as a cancer patient going through a lot of, you know, mentally taxing medications to kind of figure out what I needed when I needed it. So I was able to kind of um, choose my <laughs> most organized type A um, people in my life. And, you know, one friend was able to put together a meal calendar for me where people would um, pay her and she would make me food on my chemo weeks or like I was able, my husband was not able to come to most of my appointments with me because um, he had a really, you know, unforgiving job at the time. And my sister, I enlisted her to come with me because she's also really type A and she actually caught a mistake where a nurse had weighed me incorrectly and was going to give me the wrong dose of my chemo that morning. So um, that, yeah, that was kind of something that was really helpful to me was just being able to identify like who can help in what way because my parents weren't there and my husband was not able to help much. So I, I love that as well, Kelsey, because the 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 issue of having just an extra set of eyes and ears in the room. Yeah. I know Delicia will talk about this in a little bit too, can be so critical. We're overwhelmed. There's a lot going on. We're in the, you know, in the infusion chair or wherever we are. And so that's a big mistake that could have happened, this dosing, you know, dose issue with the with the chemo. Also, what I'm hearing from you and Erica and Tyler and everyone is maybe recognize in the people you have in your support circle, everyone has a different language, if you will. And some people are better at doing the, you know, paperwork, like Erica was talking about. Some people may be cooking, your friend with the meal calendar, being able to organize that. Um, so I appreciate that. And, and another note is people want to help, right? Absolutely. I think that that was the thing that surprised me. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know why I was surprised because I would gladly help my friends too, but the way that um, people, when my friend organized this meal calendar, people who signed up that 
I had maybe had one class with, you know, um, so like that kind of community support people were really willing to engage in, which I was uh, very, very appreciative of. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And um, Delicia and Tyler can come up too. And, and I know um, for Delicia, it's it's very similar. You talked about, um, you know, how overwhelming it is in the beginning and the importance of having somebody else there. And you were going through this during the pandemic. So can you describe how you've advocated for yourself during the pandemic to have more support? With my first oncologist, I had to really speak up a lot. Um, it was just a lot going on. I know at my first oncologist, nobody was allowed to come in with me. So I was having to, I was, I had to speak um, a lot up for myself in the appointments because I didn't really have anybody with me to um, basically remind me what the doctor said. Um, so that's where the recordings came in and uh, recording help. Um, because a lot of the times afterwards, I couldn't remember anything. I'm like, why are you asking me? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's so, overwhelming. Yeah. yeah. And we talked about, um, you know, having someone else there as extra eyes and ears. Um, also, one thing that I had learned too was you can ask the doctor if it's okay, but to record, you could record on your phone, anything, an audio app, um, the appointment so that you can then share with other people. I know Delicia had mentioned doing that as well. Tyler, um, for you very specifically, as patients were going through a lot, <laughs> a lot of treatment, a lot of changes. Um, and then on top of that, sometimes there's the, oh, paying for it part that pops up. And I know for you, it was a little, a little bit of a surprise. Can you share with us that experience of, of those hospital bills? Yeah, so uh, well, sometimes I recommend for people who are going through is just like keep like a three ring binder or something or organize your, your bills, your explanation of benefits, just something. Because all of a sudden I remember getting stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks of letters and mails. And it was all very confusing because it's like, this is how much it costs, but you don't owe anything. And then sometimes you do, and then sometimes you don't. So it's weird. So I remember getting a bill one day. Um, for a very large amount of money. And uh, I was like, why isn't this paid? So this was, uh, so every three weeks for a year, I was receiving the same treatment. And my insurance company decided that uh, just out of one of those that they weren't gonna pay for it. Um, so having to go talk to our the financial office at the uh, hospital about like what's happening what can we do about this um, you know that then finding out that there's an appeal process that you have to do with the insurance company so I did that and then they denied that appeal then finding out you can um, have your doctor make an appeal about whatever so the insurance company basically came back and said that chemo treatment that I received was not medically necessary and they weren't going to cover it even though they covered all the other ones for the past year so that was interesting. And then coming to find out that there was um, some financial help, but talking with the hospital about what's going on, what's happening. So they weren't going to like send me to collections for it. And they were actually able to find um, some sort of, um, I call it like a scholarship. I'm not what sure what the other word is for it. Someone like a grant or something that was going to help pay for someone in my situation like that. So luckily that was taken care of. So make sure you're just having those conversations. But yeah, so I remember having that conversation with our financial department of like, why is it on me to have to like, re like appeal this bill? Like I'm the patient going through all this. Why do I have to learn what health insurance is or have to deal with these insurance companies about all of this? Like, isn't that what the hospital, like that's your, you know, <laughs> like figure that out. Like, like you're, you're the one who wants that money. Like go after the insurance company. You all deal with this every day. Why is me a person going through chemo? having to deal with this or having to put my family through this who isn't versed in any of that any of that lingo, lingo. Right, right. And I think this is where it can be really important to have and, and different places, depending on the size of the hospital you're going to, they have um, different help. Some have patient navigators, some have social workers. Um, and you had talked about too, just sort of researching some of the different resources that could be possible. So thank you for sharing that, Tyler. And actually, I'd love to pop up the LLS or Leukemia and Lymphoma Society is one organization that does offer some help. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like, how do we advocate? Well, you can advocate by finding our resources, or if you don't have the energy, maybe have people around you look for that. 
Um, but just really quickly, here are some of the you know different sorts of um, you know grants and stipends at the LLS you can apply for. And it goes from copay to travel to urgent needs, which is like rent, mortgage, lodging, childcare, food, transportation, so much more. So these are the different kinds of things that we're talking about. Um, now I'd love to shift to a very important topic as we're you know, talking about mental health, <laughs> which I think can get on the back burner a lot, but self-advocacy is speaking up for every part of you, um, not just treatment and financial, but everything is connected to our mental health. So I'd like to start with Kelsey, just to give an example of, you know, Kelsey, you were talking about, you didn't really uh, process or consider the mental health aspect as you were going through treatment. I think that is fairly common. I think we talk about surviving first. Um, but can you talk about now in hindsight, sort of your perspective of mental health and that piece of, piece of it? Yeah, um, I mean, I just, really wish I would have from the get-go um, found a therapist, took a, taken advantage of any, you know, free counseling my cancer center might have had. Um, I remember, you know, I had never been to therapy or anything like that um, before I was diagnosed and I was kind of coming into the idea of it and uh, was thinking about it when I got diagnosed. And when I was diagnosed, I asked my oncologist if there were any like mental health resources I could look at or whatever. And um, I think he was in a bit of a rush to the next patient. And he was just like, you know, let's not worry about that right now. Like, let's just focus on getting you, you know, better. And I understood his perspective, but, um, you know, in hindsight, I wish that he would have said, you know, here's the information for the social worker at our clinic or something like that, because um, I think that healing mentally from this has been the, you know, far harder than like healing physically. So I, um, I would really encourage anyone who is like recently diagnosed, or even if you, um, are a survivor that's been out of it for several years, if you have never really considered, um, your own mental health or seeing a therapist or, you know, talking to your doctor or anything like that to, to do that, because, um, that's been, the longest healing process, but the most important healing process. And also for the people around me, um, you know, I didn't realize until after how difficult it was for my husband, um, because he wasn't showing how hard it was for him during the process. So for caregivers as well, I mean, I think that is so important. I again, appreciate highlighting this because we do often forget that it's, and, and not just us, I think patients, as patients, we recognize when our caregivers are burning out or feeling a lot, but it's everybody else who doesn't really quite see, hey, it's not just the person who is diagnosed, it's the mental health, the physical health, the emotional well being of these people who are also being the caregivers. That is so important. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, I'd like to also bring up Delicia because this is where sometimes where you're going for your medical care can matter too, because a lot of times it's so overwhelming. We've just been diagnosed with cancer. We're not thinking about anything other than how are we gonna get through this? Am I gonna live? Am I gonna lose my hair? What are the side effects? And for you, Delicia, I know your journey was, or your experience was that you went to two different medical centers and the first place was a lot more um, in the community. Then you ended up going to a, a big academic center so the first hospital, that wasn't even a discussion. Um, it was basically just, you know, this is what you have. This is what treatment you have. And um, the whole experience was lacking. So when I moved over to a bigger, um, a bigger hospital, um, they offered that um, mental, like, um, you know, canceling or if that's what you wanted. But I, to agree with Kelsey, I'm sorry. Um, I wish I would have took that opportunity. Um, I didn't realize how much it affected me. Um, a little background, we went through a horrible storm, hurricane. And um, during that transition, I was, um, my first hospital oncology, um, center got damaged so I went through a period without getting any treatment so um for a little few a while with no treatment not knowing where I was gonna go when I finally moved on to a bigger center like I didn't realize how much everything took a toll on me like I had like um 
I guess I, w- I don't know if you want to call it a, a panic attack or what one night and um I knew like okay I needed to talk to my doctor and be like okay this is what happened um I need to be on some kind of anxiety medicine or what because before that I never um really I had I never really knew what anxiety was I know that's crazy to sound maybe and we experience everybody experienced it but I never had it that deep um, to where I was breaking down. So that was a big thing. Yeah. And I, I also appreciate this, that you're talking about this because you had these two very different experiences. Um, and you were saying you didn't even know what sort of that good care looked or felt like, because when you went to the second place, Baton Rouge, um, you realized, oh, I was super anxious (laughs) at the first place. That's not normal. And, and so, um, and for you, Was there anything in terms of finally being able to have that conversation? Um, Did you notice an immediate shift for yourself? Like, you know, just was your quality of life different after? Oh, yes, very much. I wasn't used to the small stuff. It was the snacks, the heated blankets. I mean, (laughs) I didn't even know it was possible. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I felt like I was in luxury. And it was just basic common patient care and before I didn't even get that offer like they had free snacks drinks um my nurses were I love them my nurses my doctor I love that whole team so it was just a big adjustment like anything I needed I could just say okay I mean I need this I need that and they was immediately Amazing. I'm so glad you were able to experience that shift. Um, So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd love to talk about now, a lot of the mental health piece of it is also this, uh, for Hodgkin lymphoma patients, you know, being young um, when you're diagnosed. And so I just want to go through, um, you know, talking about these different topics of family planning. And uh, Erica, I know for you, you talked about being 37 at the time, talking to your doctor, can you share uh, more about what that conversation was like and how you had to advocate for yourself um, in that in that discussion, in that conversation? Yes. So that first oncologist appointment was just the least dramatic. Um, it was getting diagnosed, not being listened to. And with my notebook in hand, I had a list of questions. My husband and I had just um, been married for a year. And we were in the stages of family planning. So that was really important for me to ask in receiving chemo. And the, I'll just blatantly say, make the statement the doctor did to me, which was, you know, you're, you're too old. You're, this is not going to happen. We need you to get treatment like immediately because it's going to explode. And it just was shocking. All of that statement, you know, having to forgo an idea that I was planning on the idea of exploding body was really, you know, problematic for me. And I think self-advocacy really played in a role in that moment because I didn't know who my next oncologist was going to be, but I knew at this moment, this was the oncologist who was holding me back from getting a second opinion on fertility treatment. So I asked, I know this healthcare Uh, has a fertility department can I at least have a consultation with them and he said fine (laughs) so he put me in touch with the fertility clinic um, that was part of the network uh, which was actually a really positive phone consultation they just said we don't know what happens but you should go through the opinion of the oncologist Um, and when I found my oncologist that I went with about three two three weeks later I had the same conversation with them, having already talked to the fertility uh, department, said, you know, I would just suggest you go through treatment because we don't know what can happen, but he explained to me the process and I made the decision just based on that conversation to withhold it, right? And fortunately, Kelsey mentioned like removing bleomycin that was possible through my treatment because his reacher suggested that was gonna be helpful afterwards to be able to conceive as a possibility and really respected 
the conversation throughout so that when I did receive diagnosed, uh, or when I did receive remission, the first thing he said was, all right, let's get you healthy so that you can explore that conversation again. So it was just different, um, but I really would say that to ask just for someone else who is an expert on that piece. Right. And don't be afraid to ask. I think that's the self-advocacy part. I mean, it's interesting you talking about even Kelsey talked about the B, the bleomycin and the impact of the lungs. And now here you're saying that you heard from a doctor that that could have an impact too, in terms of family planning. And all of this is a result of asking questions and digging in deeper. And just the power of that is pretty incredible. Yes, definitely. Um, so thank you for sharing that, Erica. I know that was hard. You had another, just like Delicia had very two very different experiences. You had two very different doctors as well. Um, and uh, on that note, Delicia and Tyler can come up if, if they'd like this. We're wrapping up actually our session. And so I'd really like to get, if, if Kelsey wants to come on too, we can have more of a, uh, you know, an entire sort of round table, if you will. But I know for Delicia, you, a nurse did talk to you about that. Yeah, at the um, very beginning, she brought that up, that it was a possibility that I wouldn't be able to conceive. But what you just found out, you just finding out that you had cancer. So it never crossed my mind. I was just about to turn 30. I never thought about kids. I never thought about those small things. And um, I was stage four. So um, it was like, she was like, you need the treatment. You need it now. So I never explored like that conversation anymore like of you know you know freezing my eggs or anything like that um yeah I, I appreciate you sharing that too it's just all these different experiences um Kelsey did, did it cross your mind you were diagnosed on your 26th birthday <laughs> so there's a lot going on what was the consideration for you um you know I was still broke living with roommates just finished grad school it really I um it wasn't on my mind it wasn't something my husband or fiance at the time were talking about um but I actually had kind of an opposite ex experience that Erica did and that the doctors were really pushing me to explore um preserving um uh, you know my eggs and things like that um I chose not to do that because I really just wanted to get on with treatment and didn't want to go through another medical procedure. I um, was stage 2A, so the doctors, I think, you know, they they were able to give me a little bit of leeway there, but I still, I just wanted to get on with it. Um, and, you know, from the research I'd done at my stage with my amount of treatment, uh, my chances of remaining fertile were pretty high. So I do remember coming out of one of my biopsies and the nurse was just telling me about her friend who'd had cancer and now she's got like all these kids. And at the time just thinking like, I don't care. <laughs> I just don't wanna like, you know, I just wanna get on with my treatment. But now at, at 30, after having been married for a while, I, I think I would approach it very differently. Thank you for highlighting that. This is a very individual response um, and it's all about knowing where you are, what you want, and then advocating for that. So that's going to look different. It doesn't mean you have to advocate for um, family planning and freezing eggs and embryos. It also doesn't mean you should be asking. It's what is good for you. And for Tyler, um, I know you you had talked about your experience and in your parents supporting that decision. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I was 24 when I was diagnosed. So this was definitely more um, something that was discussed. And as far as how that was going to happen long term, is my mom was pushing more for it. She would love grandkids, but um, I have an older brother, younger brother, and younger sister, and none of us have produced a kid for her yet. So, um, <laughs> so she was like. Uh, so the deal was that they would pay for uh, the sperm being frozen. So um, as of today, it is a very expensive child. And we don't even know if we will use that that frozen uh, sample or not. So, um, but yeah, so that's something that we did choose, choose to do. But um, yeah, having mm -hmm. the parent support in that and, and saying that, you know, they would help financially was a uh, big decision factor in that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, there's a financial consideration to this, of course. 
um, and you're talking about their storage fees. There's all these other correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, so as we're as we're wrapping this up, I actually um, want to pop up really quickly. Um, everyone, stay on because I want to do one quick sort of around the table of talk about survivorship. Um, but I wanted to just show this because I feel like having this conversation as, you know, AYA or adolescent young adults or, you know, it's just so important. This is actually, I, I found this recently as I was preparing for this event and I actually got kind of emotional. It's a, an email correspondence between me and uh, someone I was matched to from Immerman Angels. And it's a little small to see, but basically she's reaching out to me saying, I know you're going through a lot. Um, I'm happy to share my experience with you. And then my response and actually it says in there, I'm like, uh, this is really hard. I don't really know everything that's going on. I am most frightened by chemo and loss of hair. More importantly, the fertility repercussions. That's what I wrote. I totally forgot about this email until I went to kind of digging for it. And I think the reason why I wanna highlight this is because, you know, this is, this is you know, we're co-hosting this with Immerman and having all of you, Erica, Delicia, Kelsey, Tyler on is a great example of the power of being able to find people who've been through it and can share um, experiences because I feel like that's how we learn what's possible is by hearing from other people. So with that said, um, you know, and then actually I think the next slide might show that then I signed up. I signed up to become an angel after. <laughs> I was like, I gotta pay this forward. And so I've been ever since. Um, so with that being said, I'd like to do a round as we wrap today's event on the topic of survivorship, which I think is a huge one, you know? Um, and if you could just leave with a piece of what survivorship has been like and also any sorts of guidance on, I don't know how you wanna call it. I know with survivorship, it's great. And it's also a huge drop off in care for a lot of people that can be really difficult. So if you have any examples of advocacy during, that during this time of survivorship um, and maybe we'll just start, I'll just start with Erica um, to, to start off. So I've now been in remission since March of 2020. So two years, a little over two years. And I think I just take it a day at a time, um, knowing that I can look forward and plan ahead on all things of family planning, building out my business, uh, you know, but what's now part of my experience is just being a resource and advocate for people who are going through cancer. Um, I didn't know that that was going to be part of my journey. And now that it is, I find it really important to advocate and make sure people know that there's a whole network of people who are open to talk about it and share their experience. Absolutely. And we got a comment from Rhonda who said, you all are all very lucky technology has allowed this to be a, a topic of conversation. I think technology has been a big driver in opening different avenues of communication and figuring out what is your community. Um, so Delicia, um, you know, any notes about what it's been like um, in survivorship? I know it's been pretty recent for you. Um, I just been trying to like, um, rediscover what I can and can't do I don't I learned that I don't have the same energy as I did before um so I've just been taking this time out to um doing school I just finished I just graduated so I'm happy about that um so I basically took the time off I chose not to go back to work because I'm um fortunate not um that I wasn't able me out didn't have to. Um, I was fortunate for that, but um, but I'm about to try to venture back in the workforce because it, I've been having too much lax time, uh, relaxed time. So I'm biased, but I think you've been through it. So I think you should take that time. <laughs> I don't think yeah, I don't think you have anything to to apologize for there. I think go for it. Um, but congrats on on wrapping up school, uh, Tyler. With you, any any notes on survivorship for you? Uh, survivorship. Uh, so I always have a hard time with survivorship. Um, I'm just kind of like, uh, you know, especially with having met so many other people, um, who are uh, like no longer here with us who went through similar things that I have. It's just kind of weird. That's like, I'm here, but they're not. Um, so, so that's something that I was, I was unaware of as I'm like going through it and just being like, okay, cool. Can't wait to be done with this. And then like, we'll never have to think about it again. Uh, completely wrong. Like you will always think about this, uh, anytime, 
you feel anything in your body now that you're so like attuned to like what is happening any little thing you're like oh and it's back we're doing this again okay here we go uh so but yeah for it's uh it is nice being able to like think ahead and not not worry too much about um some things like erica mentioned you know you can start planning ahead a little bit more um i think even if you're going through it just plan ahead anyways i think that's a good just focus on an end goal focus on something longer term um but yeah survivorship um and then just being you know when whenever i see um i think once you first get diagnosed so i didn't know what lymphoma was when i was told it and then found out it was cancer but uh i think once finding out that i had it all of a sudden i realized cancer was everywhere uh, you're watching, like I'd go watch a movie or something. It's like, oh, the main character has cancer. The family member has this, you know, or something like that. And then seeing like so many people in, on like my Facebook, like friend group or something like that has it. And just being that person who reaches out and just says like, hey, if you ever need to talk, like as someone who has gone through it, like I would love to just talk to you about my experience and not be someone who's offering, you know, here's solutions to get it done or like, you know, in anything like that, just being a, someone, I, I'm here as a sounding board if you just ever feel stressed out. And um, has, has been, has been, that's how I handle it, I guess. And then being a, a part of stuff like this is, is huge as well. Well, and I wanna thank you for, for being a part of this. Um, and what I hear you saying, and so much of what you just said resonated with me, what all of, all of you are saying, but Tyler in particular talking about, um, being there for people and sharing experiences is very different, I think, than like giving advice, for instance. And it's just, it, it feels more like a connection as opposed to like a one direction, let me tell you about things. So I appreciate that. And I also agree, I thought, oh, I'll be done with this. And I'm, you know, congrats on the five years. I know it's kind of weird to say, cause I'm also at my five years and I still have, I think at, at any given time of the day, there's a moment where I'm like doing this. <laughs> Because this is where my lymphoma showed up. And so I'm like, oh, is it, am I okay? Yes, and Kelsey, like we all have that down. I feel like it's a knee-jerk reaction. And also the thought of, I mean, here's that mental health piece again, right? Like it doesn't stop just because the treatment stops. There are lasting effects to this that keep going. And that mental health piece is also really important. So, but having people like you share is really critical. So thank you for that. Um, Kelsey, how about for you? on the survivorship note? Yeah, I think the first couple of years after I finished treatment, you know, I was going through a lot of changes on top of this. I, I had to push back my wedding. So I finally got married. I started my career. Um, I had three of my grandparents die within the next year after. So there's a lot going on at once. Um, and I think that my way of coping with it was just to try to make my life as aggressively normal as possible. So I, you know, Stay, stopped going out, stayed in, was just cooking dinner at home and just trying to like be in a, I guess, domestic, like relaxed space. Um, and it wasn't until more recently that I, you know, kind of started thinking more about what I want, um, which is I picked up uh, my freelance writing business a little bit more. And I started with my mom and sister, a vintage furniture um, business that's that we're really working hard on. So those things were not things I did at the beginning. Um, I think it's, it's really easy to downplay in your head, the impact, um, that things had on you, especially, I think, especially for Hodgkin's lymphoma patients, it's easy for us to be like, oh, you know, this, um, was a cancer with a high survival rate. And, um, you know, I don't deserve to feel so bad about this. And so I think that realizing, no, this is, this was a very traumatic event and um, mentally and physically, and I deserve to acknowledge that. And I, um, I was going to say to Delicia, like, don't, don't beat yourself up for not rushing back into the workforce or anything like that, because um, you do really deserve that time to heal. Um, and I think that for me, as the rest of you have um, echoed, just being a contact for other people going through this has been really important. Um, I had no resources. I knew one, I had one friend who had had Hodgkin's that I reached out to. And then um, I found a couple of women on Reddit who had, um, who had had it and 
they were one girl in particular was just so kind and gave me so much information that I really made it a point to do the same. And I've actually had a lot of, um, you know, friends or friends of friends reach out to me, um, just with cancer in general. Um, and I find that when you're a young adult with cancer, you really can feel like you're on an Island by yourself. And so even just that, those little moments of connection have been just massively important to my survivorship because I, I don't feel crazy. I don't feel like this entire experience was something that I made up in my head, you know? So I'm, I love that there was a, like, at the same time, everyone's heads were like going like this when you were talking about letting everybody have time to heal and that you did everyone, you know, we went through a traumatic experience and not to do the thing where it's like, oh, well, it wasn't as bad as the other person. How can I, and Tyler mentioned losing people. And there's all this, like a better cancer or like, no, it's traumatic. And there's a lot going on and to allow everybody a chance to just grieve that process that and give ourselves grace is so important. So I really appreciate that. Um, I want to say thank you again to everyone who joined us today um, out there in the audience and also to Erica, Delicia, Kelsey, and Tyler. So appreciate you because we couldn't do this without, without you. So thank you. All right. So everyone have a great night and uh, hope to see you at our next event. Take care. Thank you.